spoken through Danielle. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thanks, Amy. Well, thanks for having me. I'm going to be totally OCD because, you know, we all have the ways we do things, so this has to be on my left. Um, ooh, it's heavy. Now you're going to see me, like, work out a second. All right. Um, as Amy said, my name is Danielle Reeves. I'm the lead pastor at a church called Resilience Church in Littleton, Colorado, and longtime friend of Mike and Christie's. Um, Resilience Church launched on October 15th, 2020. So I've been in ministry for over 25 years at a large church in Littleton, had an opportunity to plant a church. Um, the plan was not to plant in the middle of the pandemic, as you can imagine, but that's the way that it went. And so we, um, we had a building that we looked at the day the world shut down. And after much prayer and a literal mountaintop conversation with God, uh, we ended up flipping the model and we now meet in coffee shops after hours in different parts of the Littleton area and then um, reaching out to, to Aurora as well. So it's been an amazing experience, an amazing opportunity to get to uh, partner with people. We have a lot of people that come that don't have a faith or um, something has happened, that there's been some pain that has happened in our, in our faith community, um, not our broader faith community. And um, so meeting inside a coffee shop is a little bit safer for them. So it's, it's just been a real joy. You all are partners of ours. We consider you part of our church family. Um, I know you have a sister church, but we are grateful to get to be a part of our broader capital C church that gets to work together to advance God's kingdom. So thank you um, for the invitation to be here. I, um, a few weeks ago, Mike and Christy launched this Abundant Life series, and they talked about John 10.10 10 as kind of the basis for the series, and so I wanted to put that up again just to kind of keep that in front of us, and that passage says, the thief comes only to steal and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. So as we talk about this idea of the abundant life, I think that sometimes we can get stuck in this space where we think that um, abundance means we have everything we need. As far as um, I, have, I have access to the relationships that I want, I have access to the things that I want. Abundance is everything we need, but it's everything that we need in the person of Jesus. So we can have an abundant life when things are good and when things are bad, when things are hard and when they're full of joy, when we're full of grief and lament and when we're full of happiness and connection. And so this idea of the abundant life really has to do with this transformation that happens inside of us. It's that kingdom coming in us. It's Christ's kingdom established here, but our transformation as we become more and more, uh, more and more accurate reflections of him, there's an abundance that comes in that. So over a nine-week period of time, we're in this series on Life Abundant. Two weeks ago, Amelia came and talked about prayer, and she did a great job of setting up um, the Lord's Prayer as kind of a model for prayer. And then last week, Chanda's talked about community and the fact that community is a verb. It's an action. There's activity to community as we gather together with other people. This week's topic is on scripture and how to engage it for transformation. So before we dive into that, a couple of side notes. The first is that the staff was telling me when they were choosing which spiritual formation practices to have, that nobody got to pick one that they were good at, and they kind of looked at each other and determined, hey, you need to take this one. I'm curious to know why I got the phone call then to lead on scripture. Um, I'm not sure if I should feel <laughs> insecure about that. Oh, it's cracking me up. Uh, <laughs> but... What, what I did, it actually really struck something in me. I have a seminary degree, so I've studied Bible. Um, I'm in a doctorate program. I'm studying Bible some more. And yet, Scripture is still a place that can actually create deep shame in me. And so as we talk about this topic of Scripture, I, I want you to know that we're co-journeyers. I'm not an expert. I may have some information to pass along, but I'm part of the same journey that you're on. I'm, I'm part of the journey of learning what it means to love and live like Jesus and what it means to be transformed by his word. So let me tell you a little bit about, um, about this shame that I feel. Brene Brown says, shame is that warm feeling that washes over us, making us feel small, flawed, and never good enough. 
My shame around scripture started early. I did not grow up in the church. I came to Christ um, in high school through Young Life. And when those early years when I um, thought about, when I started showing up, I would show up at like Young Life campaigners group or um, church on occasion. I would show up and I'd have all these questions and curiosity about what the word of God was saying. And I felt embarrassed because it seemed like everybody else had all the answers. So I, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anything because I didn't, I didn't grow up in that context. And so this shame that washed over me, it made me feel like um, I was supposed to know something to be able to be part of God's story. As time went on and I grew in my faith, the shame kind of shifted into this new arena and it really had to do with language. So when we talk about spiritual practices, another phrase for spiritual practices is spiritual disciplines. So as I was in college, I went to Azusa Pacific University, I'm learning more about who Jesus is and about his word, and we're talking about spiritual discipline, but that word discipline does not feel good to me. The the way that it was feeling was that coming to the word of God then meant that I was coming to receive discipline, that I was in trouble that there was this, this God that sat on this, thro- this distant throne and he was looking down and had written this book of rules to tell me what to do and he was waiting to catch me doing all the wrong stuff. So that, that word discipline really impacted me deeply. Even the word um, practice, spiritual practice, threw me off because I, in high school, played basketball and practice represented you had to show up and do what the coach told you to do, which was a lot of hard work, and if you didn't do it the right way, you got benched. So I had this this misunderstanding of what it meant to study scripture that was so full of shame, both early on and then later in life. And what's interesting about shame, I don't know if you've noticed this, but shame causes shame causes shame. We begin to feel shame about the fact that we feel shame. So it's this very cyclical piece. In this season of life, one of the things that I've realized that's happening inside of me is that I'm, I'm viewing the word of God Similar to uh, being in the, in the garden with Adam and Eve. It's this, I'm experiencing God from a skewed perspective. It's when the snake went to Adam and Eve and said, God isn't really who he says he is. He's something different. And if you listen to me, you'll have everything that you need. But that's not real. What's real is God that came in the flesh in Jesus and showed us his transformational power and his love and his grace and his compassion and his justice. So for me, my current journey is stepping out of the garden and the shame that I feel around scripture, around reading God's word, around misunderstanding it at times, and stepping into the freedom of Christ. Brene Brown says, if you put shame in a Petri dish, it needs three ingredients to grow exponentially. Secrecy, silence, and judgment. If you put the same amount in the Petri dish and douse it with empathy, It can't survive. My hope for us this morning is that we realize that it's okay if we have these places of shame around Scripture. We're in it together. It doesn't make us bad. Um, It makes us human. And that sometimes bringing it out of the secrecy space and acknowledging it, even if it's just within ourselves, it really brings us freedom. So my prayer for us this morning is that as we dive into Scripture, as we dive into kind of some some overviews of what Scripture means and the Word of God means, that we would be released of that shame. All right, let's dive in a little bit. Um, As I was thinking about this topic and thinking about, okay, in my own life, I feel the shame around Scripture. What am I looking for? Um, I ran across this interesting study. So I was thinking like, okay, what's the point of the Bible? So there's just this study that came out, American Bible Society's recent, it's called the Bible Engagement Study. It came out this year, 2022. And I thought this was fascinating. According to their findings, those who read the Bible three to four times per year outside of church has decreased significantly over the past eight years. So it went from 53% in 2014, 48% in 2020, and 39% in 2022. All right, so that's data point. Here's the part that really I thought was intriguing. At the same time, half of Americans in that same study believe the Bible contains everything a person needs to know to live a meaningful life. So my question is, where's the disconnect for us? Where's the disconnect between believing that there's something in the Word of God that's for us and transforms us, but then not wanting to connect with it outside of this space and this room? 
And so I think a couple of questions to explore um, that will maybe help us discover the disconnect between that is what's the nature of God's word and how does it transform our lives? So the, let's talk about what's the nature of God's word. God's word, he, God is God, a God of communication. He has always revealed himself to his creation, his humans included, through his spoken word, through his written word, through his inspired word. God is a God of communication. It was, I loved, we were praying before service, and Michael was talking about um, how amazing it is that God knows what we're thinking and what we're, before we even speak our words out loud, he knows because he's a God that knows us intimately. But the same is not reverse. We don't magically know what God is thinking because we're not God. And so for him to give us his word is this true gift. He is this God of communication. That makes the Bible an instrument of self-revelation of who God is. And we see this starting back in the New Testament in, or the Old Testament. In fact, the very first um, chapter of the Bible, Genesis 1, talks about the word is God, the word is with God. God, God gave his word. He created it out of his word. Something is powerful in that. We think of words as just this exchange of um, information or a greeting, but something is more powerful than that. Something is happening here in God's word that makes it creative and transformative. Um, we can capture that a little bit, recognizing that there's power in our own words. So if I, if I give you a compliment, there's power in that. I have the power, those words have the power to leave you feeling really positive. But if I say something negative, those words have the power to leave us really feeling badly. God's word is, has this power behind it, but it is always for our good, it's always for our transformation, it's always for his edification. There, um, God's word, he uses these, these words of his to, um, the way that he describes them reflect his very character. So I want to read some of the words that describe him. This is just out of the Old Testament. And sometimes I think that's important because sometimes I think when we read the Old Testament, um, there is some stuff in there that is really hard for us to understand. And so sometimes the God of the Old Testament can feel like a very different God from the God of the New Testament. He's the same God. It's the same God. Let me describe some of the words that are used in the Old Testament to describe his words. Creative, good, holy, complete, flawless, all-sufficient, sure, right and true, understandable, active, all-powerful, indestructible, supreme, eternal, life-giving, wise, and trustworthy. Those words are important because they're words that God has given to his people to not only describe his word, but to describe him. They're intertwined with one another. So as we're thinking about what is this word of God, the word of God is, is his reflection of himself. It's his illuminating who he is to his people. The word of God also discloses God's plan for all of creation, God, God gives us this amazing, sometimes we call it a meta-narrative. It's the grand story. It's the reality that all of these stories within the Bible may feel like these kind of one-off stories, but they're all part of one bigger story. In fact, as you start to read, you'll realize there's hyperlinks between the Old Testament stories and the New Testament stories and the characters. It's all part of this grand meta-narrative that starts with God's creation, the goodness of his creation. God's word is telling us about the goodness of that creation. God's word tells us about the fall and where we as humans pursued wanting to be right and have knowledge above what God's knowledge looked like. Um, it talks about the brokenness that happened because of our human desire to be bigger than, than God himself. And it talks about the restoration that happened when Christ came, um, again, in God's word incarnate. So we've got Christ who has arrived, his life, his death, and his resurrection become God's living word right in front of us. And then we see this kingdom that's been established that's coming in its fullness. It's the word of God that gives us hope for what's ahead. It's this word that says, hey, this isn't the end of the story. We live in the now and the not yet, but Christ is going to return and restore all things back to himself. So we've got this powerful piece where God's word is giving his creation what's, um, for, in our case, what's happened what, and what's ahead. So it's this amazing, self-reflective uh, tool that God has given us. 
God's word isn't just in the Old Testament. It's in the New Testament as well. That's part of that meta narrative story. And there's, a, um, there's an image that God gives to describe what the word of God is like. And it's the image of a seed. Uh, there's the story of the sower. It's a farmer who's gone out. Um, I think they describe the farmer as a he. So he is, he's sowing his seeds. He's throwing them out into the field. And the story describes some of those seeds fall on rock. Some of the seeds fall um, on fertile ground, but then the weeds come up. And some of it um, is on fertile ground, and then those seeds grow. I want to take a minute to read what happens after that, because this is one of the few places that Jesus actually tells us what his parable means, and it's about the word of God. So I think it's important for us today. So um, Luke 8, 11 through 15 says this, this is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear, and then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts, so they may not believe and be saved. Those on the rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. The implication here is that the word of God is much bigger than we are that we have this desire to taste it and touch it and feel it, but there is some mystery to God's word. There's something that happens that is transformative. Again, it's, it's beyond just this ex- exchange of conversation. It's something that, is, um, that invites us into transformation in the person of Jesus. So I want to talk a little bit about that. So we've got a little bit of the nature of God. I want to talk about now that transformation of God's word. Hearing God's word reaches beyond information about Jesus, about God, to experience the full, powerful action of God. I think that is really vital because I think oftentimes we read the word of God as if it's just information we're trying to gain. There's nothing wrong with information, but we're missing the fullness of the invitation. We don't just read God's word to mark it off of our to-do list. Mike and Christy talked about this at the beginning of the series, that these practices, it's not, these aren't intended to be, um, there's, a, there's a lot of value to creating intentionality in our lives. Intentionality is different from creating a checklist that we, we, results in shame. So the goal isn't to, to create the shame, but the goal is to approach God's word and recognize that there's something in there for us. And, and we can go back and read the same passage again and again and again, and what God reveals to us may change. His, his word, if you think about that, it, um, it launches over all of time, all of people, all cultures, and there's something in that that God invites us into again and again and again. So it's, in for, it's not information about God, it's an experience of the powerful action of God. The other thing is that through the practice of reading the Bible, we become active participants in that word of God. Again, something happens to us. We're not, um, you know, I think about when we go watch a movie and we're watching that movie and, and I don't know how often this happens with you, but sometimes I like feel like I'm in the movie. Like Top Gun, I now feel like I'm a, you know, I'm a pilot. I'm like zooming through those, those valleys. We enter into the story and sometimes we're even transformed by it. Honestly, when Top Gun came out, um, I was in high school. I know that just, just aged me. Um, but when the first one came out, I, and then I guess what I wanted to do? I wanted to go into the Air Force and become a pilot. And I think statistics show there were a ton of people that that was true for. Because we get into movies, and those movies like change us. They transform us. They, something about us gets us excited about what's going on. The Word of God invites us to do the same, but even in more powerful ways. So we really want to be active participants in that. And then it's only through our interaction with God, our own transformation, that true flourishing happens. Our flourishing as individuals, but our flourishing as a community occurs when we step into this word of God, we let it transform us, and we, we try not to get into this stagnant place where we say, well, the word of God communicated this to me in this period of time, so it has to communicate the same t- thing to me again and again. We grow and change. And so that word of God is going to change in us. So we want to stay as active participants in this transformative word of God. 
So then the question is, well, how, how do we do this? And this is, this is the purpose behind these practices. Um, practices are just that. So it's not the shame practice that I was talking about. It's not that if you don't show up for practice, you're going to be benched. It's called a practice because it's okay if we try it and we're like, that, that's not my thing. Or, you know, try it a couple times. I, what is it when you eat a new food, you have to try it like 15 times before you like it? I, let's try some of these practices multiple times before we say, that's not for me. But the idea is just to practice. We're, we, God is this God of grace that invites us to give things a, a shot. Um, he's not standing up there waiting for us to mess up. So there's practice in this. And then the discipline part is that we're all um, more effective when we create intentionality. There's a, there was a study done a number of years ago that, was, that talked about people going to the gym. And it was something like, so one group of people, they went to the gym, or they were told, um, we just want you to go to the gym. The second group of people were told, we want you to go to the gym and listen to motivational tapes. Tapes, whatever. Um, <laughs> eight tracks, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> For those of you too young, those were the old tapes. Um, so they were supposed to listen to, to motivational um, on their iPhones. And then the third group, they were told to create an intentional plan about working out. Group number one were successful, let's say, 46% of the time. Group number two, the motivational tapes, it actually went down. They were successful like 43% of the time. But those who created intentionality, their success at going to the gym went up to like 90%. So there is scientific studies and sociological studies behind the reality that when we create intentionality, it creates follow through. That's what that, that word discipline means. It's just creating intentionality. So we're going to give you these five practices. Um, I'll talk about some more than others, but just know uh, if you are like me and some of these terminologies um, weigh you down, just know that these are intended for our flourishing. All right, first practice is devotional reading. So devotional reading invites us to take, um, it can be a passage, it can be a few verses, it can be an entire book of the Bible. It invites us to read it and think about it and reflect on it and then to find some additional resources to give us more information. This is a great time to Google, although I will tell you Google can be our best friend and our worst enemy. So um, helpful, I think, to find reliable resources that we can Google. Um, commentaries by biblical authors, that's a good resource if you want to know that, that that's a positive one. Um, the Bible Project, if you've heard of the Bible Project, they have an app and they've got a great online presence. They're a really reliable source. Um, so you just you want to make sure that you're, you're reading information that is true to God's word. But the idea behind devotional reading is you're reading it and then you're getting some extra information. And what that does is it brings the story to life. It doesn't negate the process we've just gone through to study God's word and really try to understand what it's saying to us, but it broadens us, so it gives us more information. I think doing devotional reading is really powerful as an individual. I think it's extra powerful when we can do it with someone else. This struck me a couple weeks ago. Um, I, was in on, I was in online class with my Asbury class. Um, Asbury is this phenomenal program. I've never been in a more diverse learning environment as I have at Asbury. Um, I'm, in, I'm in a class with people from six continents and 17 countries around the world. So we're doing this online Zoom, and we're supposed to do this devotional reading. And so a guy named Girish and I are on Zoom. Girish is from um, India, and we're supposed to read Luke 24. So the, the assignment is read Luke 24 and then kind of do your own devotional reflection on it. So I read Luke 24, and Luke 24 is um, Jesus has just been crucified, leading into Luke 24. Luke 24 starts with the women that go to the tomb. They realize that Jesus isn't there. They go to report to the rest of the disciples. And then we have the story of the disciples that are walking on the road, like literally with Jesus, and they don't recognize him, and then they do. And then it ends with um, Jesus eating with all of the disciples. They're still not sure he is who he says he is. So he's showing them his hands and his feet, and he's eating with them to show that he really, you know, he's a human physical presence. As I'm reading that and I'm reflecting on it, what stood out to me was this um, rhythm of, of belief and disbelief. 
that you've got the women that believed, and then they tell the disciples, and the disciples like, no, we don't believe it. And then you've got these people on the path, they, believe, they don't believe, and then they believe, and then the disciples. So I'm experiencing this rhythm of belief and disbelief. And so how, um, how, the way that God is speaking to me in that moment is this conviction of where do I go in and out of belief and disbelief in my own life? Where are there times that I believe that Jesus is who he says he is, and what are the times that, that I'm not really sure? So I'm connecting with the, the characters in the story in that. After we were done doing the devotional reading on our own, then we were supposed to get together with the people in our class. So in, in this case, it was just Girish and I that day, and share what we were reflecting on. Girish, Girish shared that for him, he was really focused on the fact that it was the women that were, were the first to the tomb. His question was, why wasn't it Peter? In earlier stories, Peter's the one that's given the keys to the kingdom. Peter's the one that is like gung-ho for Jesus. So Girish is like, why, why wasn't Peter there? And as Girish was, was reflecting, for him, he was reflecting on how powerful it was in his life that Jesus used a group of women to be the first to recognize he was who he said he was. And how transformational that was in his cultural context in a context in, around the world where oftentimes, and in, in the story itself, it would have been unheard of for women to be acknowledged as the first ones to see Jesus. Women weren't even allowed to have a voice. So as Girish was sharing what was transformational for him, Jesus, single women, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, who would have been a government official, so single and married women that were traveling with Jesus, I didn't, I missed that. So Lectio Divina for me in that space, it just, it, it popped out at me. And, and when those things pop out, the hope is that it doesn't just pop out about what's happening in the story, but it pops out as far as how we're invited into that story. So for me, as a woman, I'm like, oh, you're inviting me to travel with you. You're inviting me to provide for your ministry out of my own means. You're inviting me to travel men and women together. That's, that's the power of Lectio Divina. It's helping us reveal, it's helping God's word um, reveal itself in the context and then helps us apply it to our own lives. Out of that, and these all kind of intertwine, you'll see that naturally. Um, out of that, there's a third practice called meditation. Now meditation, oftentimes we think of other religious practices that engage in meditation. And um, with some religious practices or some non-religious practices, the idea of meditation is to meditate on a, a god or a, a um, piece of creation. And so sometimes we can feel uncomfortable about that word meditation. So let me reframe it for you. Meditation is just putting our eyes on the person of God or the person of Christ. It's, it's sitting in the space, it's reading scripture, and it's just reflecting on who God is. I think meditation is a really cool opportunity because we, um, we only know what we know from our context. So my image of God, if I could write that down in detail, actually probably looks a little bit different from yours, even if we're worshiping the same God, because we, um, our broken humanity shapes God into a little bit sometimes of who we want him to be. In my case, when I was talking earlier about that shame, because I had God as like the old white guy that was up in the corner that was like waiting for me to mess up on things, like that just ties to junk in my story. That, that's not really God. Meditation is an opportunity to really dig into more deeply, well, who is this person of God? And again, we can do meditation on our own, but man, how powerful is it if I'm meditating on my own, on on God's word, and you're meditating, and we get to get together and talk about it, it gives us a clearer picture of who God is. So that's meditation. This next one, the fourth one, is the one that I'm worst at. It's memorization. Um, I am ADHD brain, and memorization is my worst nightmare. When I was in high school or college, um, having to memorize history facts and geography the were the worst. Um, I felt shame every time I went into a test and I would either totally bomb it or I'd write everything down as fast as I could and then if you asked me literally 10 minutes later, like I wouldn't remember. So memorization is hard for me. 
Um, If memorization is hard for any of the rest of you, I have a verse that I'm going to teach you right now. Are you ready? Jesus wept. (laughs) All right? So now we all have one. We can feel good about ourselves. Um, Even though memorizing scripture is hard for me, um, I also see a ton of value in it. So it takes me a lot of work to do it, but the reason I think it's really valuable, that scripture, just like when we memorize a song, and that song comes back to us, we can be hiking, we don't even have to have the music on, we're like reflecting on it, it's the same with the word of God. When we memorize scripture, it doesn't have to be long, it can be just a verse, if we find some of that key scripture, when we're in times of trial, or we're alone, or we're... Um, full of joy, whatever circumstance we're in, that comes back to us because it's, it's kind of infiltrated our beings. So memorization is something that I really believe in. I just am terrible at it. So that's the fourth one. All right, last one I'm going to talk about today is the SOAP method. This is my favorite, actually. It's just the one that I'm drawn to most naturally. Um, SOAP stands for Scripture, Observation, Application, and Prayer. The reason I like this one is because I think it gives um, the fullest understanding. I kind of geek out on deep diving into stuff sometimes. So I think it gives us the fullest understanding of a scripture passage. So if you're really wanting to look at, um, like I was talking about earlier, that passage in Luke, what this does is it starts with reminding us to look at the story not only in its small section, but how does that fit into the story before it and after we, you know, if we were reading um, Harry Potter and we picked up in the middle, if we didn't read what came before and what came after, what we were reading may not really capture what the story's talking about. So um, studying scripture invites us to look at what happens before and what happens after, what happens in the entirety of the book that's being written, um, what kind of literature is it? Um, I don't know if you know that the works in the Bible aren't all the same types of literature. Some is poetry, some is narrative. Some is um, creation literature, some is historical literature. Just like we wouldn't read a nonfiction book and a fiction book the same way, we need to to be aware of how we read different types of literature in the Bible. So this S of soap, it just encourages us to look at what's what's the context of the story, um, who's the author, and uh, what kind of literature is this. All of this is stuff you can Google. That you do not need to go to school to get all of this. Again, um, there are some great, so one of the best resources is a study Bible. So it's a, it's a Bible, but it just has extra information in it. That's a great way to get all this information. They do a great job of giving you the, the context in that. So that's the S part. O is observation. Uh, we talked a little bit about observation in Lectio Divina, but it's, it's paying attention to things like, are there repeated words that are happening in here? or repeated ideas? Um, What questions do I have? I think observation is a great opportunity to approach scripture as curious learners. I think when we listen to a podcast or, um, again, we watch a movie or we read a book, we're constantly asking who are the characters, what's the setting, what's happening in the story. But for some reason, when we come to the Bible, sometimes we freeze, and, and at least in my own life, I have felt like I'm not supposed to ask any questions. God is a a God who welcomes questions. Jesus himself asked questions of of his father. Um, So it's okay for us to ask questions, and it actually helps us understand what's going on. So observation is really about asking questions and becoming curious. Once we get to application, the goal of application, we always want to understand that to the best of our ability, okay, there is not enough time for any of us to have all of the right answers about the Bible. That will never happen. I don't think God created his word for us to master. So we're never, that, that's just not going to be a part of what happens. That's not even our goal, right? We just want to be transformed by it. But when we're looking at application, we want to make sure that we're paying attention to the author's intent to the original audience, If we understand that first and then figure out how it applies to our own lives, that's that's the closest we can get to understanding God's word. We get even closer than if we talk about it in community. But we need to look at the author's intent to the original audience first and then apply it to our lives. Um, That's application. And then the final one is prayer. We we don't want to just approach God's word, again, intellectually. We want to be transformed by it and Um, prayer is conversation with God. We don't have to have the right words. It's just dialogue. I talk to God driving down the road constantly, and I have all sorts of questions for him. 
Um, he doesn't answer me most of the time. But prayer just becomes this, this opportunity to wrestle with. What, what does this mean? And how do I apply this? And how do I, how do, I do this in the context of community? So, um, so that's what SOAP is. All right, so these five methods of reading the Bible, they're, they're intended for transformation. Um, they're intended for really revealing not only God's word as the word, but as the action. And then inviting us to be active participants in that word. So um, I want to leave you with a story. Um, I've talked a couple of times about the fact that when we do this individually, it's really powerful. But when we do it in the context of community, it's even more powerful. If you think about the original audience that would have, um, that these stories were, were spoken to when they first happened, um, first thing about those original, that original audience was that um, they did life in community much differently than we do. We're a very individualistic society. I, there's no judgment on that. That's just we're wired more individualistically. Their entire community would have done things together. It would have been extended family. We would have all been listening to the Word of God at the same time. And we would have been listening to it because it wouldn't have been written at that time. So there's something powerful that happens because if you think about it, if we're listening to the Word of God together and we're passing it on to generation, to the next generation, to the next generation, there's built-in accountability. So if somebody over on this side of the room says, this is, um, this is what the Word of God is saying, and this side of the room is like, no, 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 that's not what we've heard and been taught. There's positive accountability in that. The same is true when we do life in community and we study God's word in community. It actually takes that shame that we talked about at the beginning of this and it creates the freedom. It brings it out into the open. It helps us to get a, a broader image of God's, of who God is. So for me, um, the, this was powerfully um, I, I experienced this powerfully a couple weeks back. We were gathering as a Resilience Church community in a coffee shop, and we were studying God's Word. We were asking questions. We were practicing being curious learners. And I looked around the table, and I realized I was sitting across from a fifth grader and a nurse and a Vietnam vet, um, a gal who is French and a dual citizen, um, a deist, and a freshman in college. And all of those people were sharing, similarly when Girish and I were on Zoom together, they were all sharing their perspective of what they were hearing from God, of how they experienced God's word. And it was in listening to that story um, through their eyes that I realized that hope of the future of Jesus' return, where those from all tribes, tongues, and nations gather together to worship the one God. It was this image that Jesus invites all of us to the table to be unified around the word of God, but he doesn't ask us to be uniform. He doesn't ask us to look the same or think the same or come from the same culture. That's what makes the word of God so powerful is when we can actually use the diversity that's all around us to listen together. And so that's my prayer for us, that we would have that same transformational experience, not just through reading the word of God, not just through letting it transform us, but letting us transform us in the context of a community of people that look and think differently than we do, because I think that presents the fullness of God's character. May we be a people that leans into that invitation.